Hello, everyone, and welcome to Weekly Manga Recap here on the 1st of March, 2018. I am Nick here with Chris, and uh, we're going to be talking about a weird series today. Wait um, a minute. I, Nick, it's March? It's March, yeah. When the fuck did that happen? Oh, uh, today? Fuck me. Really? Holy shit. Where did February go? It was very short, and I, not just because it was only, you know, the shortest month of the year. It did feel actually very short. I, I could have sworn we had another week of February left. That's disturbing. <laughs> well, not, no, February is the longest month of the year. It lasts 35 days, guys. Come on. Ooh, Nick, you want to know something cool, though? Yes. So uh, last week I mentioned I made a joke about how if I showed up with mutton chops this week, would you fangirl out like Sakijo did? Mm-hmm. And it's a little tough to tell because of the lighting, the fact my camera is not great. But I did actually shave the bottom oh, of my beard. You did, so I you got did like go, you're, you're starting off a little bit of a Logan. I've given a little bit of a Logan old Civil War general kind of vibe going on. So I need you to fangirl over my new appearance, Nick. Because that's okay. what uh, that's what friends do. Friends they, do. They, they, yeah. So I, Nick, I got some. Sh- I don't know if you like mustered your troops or something. I did. It was all independent. But I, there were people who were just like, "Come on, Nick." <laughs> I had to explain myself over. I was like, I have said on the show that I think that I'm going to end up being wrong, wrong about, but we haven't hit that finish line yet. Like, <laughs> there's been no moment where Sekiju has been like, God, I was want to like fucking stroke Rizu's hair. Like, <laughs> <laughs> I feel like she's been close to that at points. She's gotten close, but she hasn't. <laughs> Well, Any, anyway, let me let me muster the uh, the yeah. usual girlish enthusiasm. Oh, yeah. glee let me let I... me set you up, Nick. Did you see my new beard combo? Did you do that for me? No. Yeah. No, that's weird. Okay, you're a weirdo, Nick. Okay, you're a strange, weird little man. We're not yep. friends anymore. Oh, okay. <laughs> But we can still podcast together. I'll just keep on talking. I'll just keep on talking about the monk of the call lens and I'm talking to nobody. (laughs) (laughs) I'm just like, Nick, I'm going to be back in in just a moment. You just, (laughs) you handle this. I'm going to be right back, though. You don't even, like, tape up the piece of paper. You just hold it there. (laughs) I'm like, Nick, I'm going to be back in just a moment. (laughs) (laughs) Shit, not to find that. All right, continue on, Nick. I'll be around. I I slapped it really hard. Why did you do that? I'm a method actor, Nick. I'm like Daniel Day-Lewis. God. You mentioned if you had broken that. It's fine. Oh, my gosh. Okay. So, let's talk about... um, Love? Another weird relationship series. Um, this is one that we started uh, basically at the, at the beginning of the month. Uh, the Ancient Magus Bride, which is a show that, well, it's manga, sorry, that's gotten an anime uh, adapted from it last year. Um, it's a popular series, but not without its controversies. Yes. The uh, series is basically about a uh, girl named Chise who uh, has had a shit life owing to her ability to see strange creatures when uh, almost nobody else around her can see them. So she's been ostracized and has caused her family has blamed her for their troubles. And uh, when she was left on her own, uh, she decided that she might as well, in order to, um, you know, survive, that she might as well sell herself into slavery. And she's bought... By this uh, strange creature, human guy with a very large goat skull for a head, uh, named Elias, decides to buy her. And Elias is uh, is a wizard who has decided to take her under his wing uh, to be his apprentice. And also as his fiance, he he intends to uh, make her his bride eventually. And... That's kind of all you need to know for us to start talking about it. Now, there's a lot of like 
uh, Stockholm Syndrome vibes coming off this series. And I'll admit, at first I was like, oh, I think the people might have overreacted a little bit to this. You know, it's not that bad, but no, no. A few chapters in, I was like, oh, okay, here's, here it is. <laughs> she learns that everything that he told her that he was going to do was a complete lie. And then she still decides, no, I still care about him. I'm going to stay as his slave forever. Oh. <laughs> well, here's the thing. So... I would disagree on that to a certain point because I was going into this expecting significantly worse than what we got, especially based on the first chapter, which starts off with the lead character in like a chain and shackles and things like that being sold and purchased. I thought this was going to be a lot more almost like 50 shades. Like it was going to be like half romance story, half kink thing, but it doesn't really play into it as much about that. Uh, there is certain elements of it, and there is one really weird thing where he, uh, Elias, continues to kind of like refer to her as like a puppy, it would be like my little puppy or things like that. That's a bit questionable, but I was surprised at how much more the story is really just about kind of someone who is directionless and like just given up on life about finding a sense of self-worth and growing to be a stronger person because of it. That's that's where I found that most of the series really lies on. It's not as much about like this idea of her being literally owned by him because very quickly they kind of drop a lot of that and that's not what the series is really focused in on. You know, it's like he walks her around in a collar and shit, and it's just like a... <laughs> it's not like it's like a Nana Takaru or anything like that afterwards. Uh, it's a lot more almost like Twilight afterwards, or maybe like Twilight meets Harry Potter, where it's like a romance story that's a quite bit unorthodox, but also is just surrounded by a bunch of magical creatures and things like that. Yeah, um, it was also it is it was considered to be less. Um, I don't know if I want to even say sexual. That's not quite the right adjective uh, when it comes to this. But the level of the amount of intimacy, I, I guess, between them is not as much uh, as I was thinking. Especially when you look at you know some some of the. Uh, arc for the series and also it begins with him stripping her clothes off in order to bathe her but then it's just and then it's just going to play a little bit for a joke and then moved on from um there is considerably less uh of elias um kind of forcing chise to reckon with the idea of you know you will be my woman and have my babies kind of stuff he's very very kind of matter of fact about about a lot of things um and that's explained as part of his character which is that he has some degree of human emotions but they're not complete and he doesn't fully understand them uh so for one thing he doesn't see the unusual part of him saying like and you will be my bride you know, it's that just doesn't occur to him um oh, fortunately one thing, one thing we think we should also mention is she is 15 by the way at the start of this. So it's, yeah. it's a child bride thing almost to a certain extent. And he's considerably more than 15. Also, apparently it's part of the culture of, of the uh, group that he's from that. Um, yeah. If you take someone on as your apprentice, then they essentially become your child. Uh, but also sometimes sons and daughters becomes husbands and wives. It's like, it's a fucked up weird. It's so weird. And I guess it's just this is this just has to do with the fact that you know they have extremely extended lives. So as a result, they just you know have to live differently. But it's it's a it's a bit off putting as a result of that. Um, but it's just something that you just kind of have to roll with. Uh, if and if it's something you get caught up on, then well, it's a fantasy series, so. You know. At first, it does it does seem very strange at certain points, um, and I think that that when you when you, whenever that kind of stuff comes up with a series, you know, a, an element that could be considered quote unquote problematic, um, 
it's worth at least recognizing it and discussing it. But if you look at it in the entire context of the whole series, they do a pretty good job of actually addressing it and also addressing why Chise is so strangely accepting of this role that Eli- Elias uh, intends to have for her, um, which is that she hasn't had a good life. And uh, so the fact that she is this way um, and other characters even bring up, it's like, you know, you shouldn't just like accept the fact that you're going to be raised as this kind of pet. You shouldn't just go along with things just because that's how he wants things to do. Um, but it's because she's has, doesn't had the development that a normal person of her age would have by that point. But then again, neither is Elias. And so they're kind of more these two fucked up people who found each other more than anything else. And it makes the relationship more interesting and acceptable. So it's pretty easy to take out certain portions of the series and then, you know, kind of go through them out of context and think this is really creepy. And even within context, they're a little bit weird. But if you go through it all together, then it's actually really interesting and I didn't really have as much of a problem with this as I thought I was going to going into it. So, yeah, I think uh, part of it to me kind of just came down to accepting the series as what it was. And that's sort of this romance series that spends a very healthy portion of it kind of just going over this this girl, she say, and, and kind of giving her some way of trying to find some level of self-satisfaction with herself. And if it definitely falls into that line of like being almost like a clamp series where like, here's 78 fucking side characters. They have one important episode each, but they'll stay around forever. Like they'll all hang around. Mm -hmm. So, so you get to kind of have that big side cast and she gets to meet a huge group of friends and she grows to find a family that she hasn't had. And that's great. That's totally awesome. Uh, it's not for me, per se, because I'm just not into that sort of storytelling all the time. But I was glad to see that there was something to this that was more than just, uh, you know, what the initial premise on the box looked like. Because, again, if you read this thing off its description, it does sound like it's going to be something different than what it is. Um, and after watching, reading, going through parts of it... Uh, I definitely found it to be something a bit more surprising. And I think the thing that really shocked me about this is Elias himself and his design. Because it is almost as unsexual of a design as I can think of. Like, when people point at, like, Beauty and the Beast, you're like, yeah, of course fucking Bell's all about that. He's, like, the epitome, like, of monstral manhood. He's enormous, hairy, muscular, powerful. Of course you'd be into that. He's got those big open eyes. <laughs> yeah. This thing is a fucking bull skull <laughs> on top of a tuxedo. Like, it's, like, gothic horror. Like, that's where you're, like, it's surprising she can find the humanity in there. Now, it makes sense because... Elias acts like he's fucking 12 most of the time. Like, he's a distinguished gentleman, but he's a fucking child when it comes to interacting with people. Like, he gets reprimand all the time, and you see him in the corner, like, doing, like, oh, I'm sorry <laughs> about this. There's um, a lot of moments where he's, you know, chipified, and so his his skull just takes on this very cartoonish look. It's way more rounded. Uh, and, yeah, it's, it's strange. He actually looks kind of just cute more than anything else even in his default uh, appearance because he's just this big oh oh <laughs> it's weird because like you know like a shape of water is big right now and you can mm-hmm. most people are like i get it i get why you'd fall in love with this fish man this is one of the few times like this seems like this would be a big hurdle to overcome <laughs> it's just like it's just a floating like deer skull with two red glowing wisps in its eyes but she finds a way and that's good for her um I think one thing I really want to hit on, though, is is Chise and talk about her a bit. Because this entire premise is based around the idea that she was in such a dark, miserable place anymore, where she was basically about to commit suicide, and someone convinced her, hey, maybe you should try to see if there's someone else in the world who would take you. And it's... Hey, if you're going to kill yourself and give up on everything, 
why not try slavery? <laughs> Basically. And it's weird because he's kind of played Take to be a, a pamphlet. <laughs> he's kind of played to be a hero. Like, they're kind of like, he really did save your life, he kiddo. He offered me a chance to have a new life, a life in perpetual, inescapable servitude where I am treated as less than human. <laughs> so they, they, they paint her in that way as, as being this depressed, but they do truly make a good case for why she's as low as she is in her life. It, it, it's one of those things where it wasn't just like, my mom's dead and I'm sad or something like that. Like, my dreams aren't coming true. It's like, oh, every member of her family is either dead or gone. Everyone in her life hates her. She's constantly being attacked by things. Like, it's just a horrifying existence for her that she's been trying to do. Like, even grew up in poverty on top of that before what little she had was taken away. Like, you do get why she's reached that point where she's just like, I have, I don't even care about myself anymore. Yeah, maybe someone out there will give a fuck about me, but whatever. I don't even care anymore. And you could do, you could actually see it too, kind of portrayed. Like, she has these, like, heavy bags under her eyes and just this dead-eyed expression through a lot of the early chapters. And there is something very satisfying about seeing that through to later chapters and later moments where she is not just become like a full person, but she's become like an optimist in a lot of ways. Mm -hmm. And she has a healthy expression and she's she's made friends with people that aren't yeah. just the guy who bought her and things like that. You're like, oh, okay, there, that's a nice there are characters that, you know, she meets because of her connection to Elias. And uh, at one point fairly early on, uh one of them hasn't seen her after a while and she he sees her and she's like, oh, wow, you, you, you look healthier. You know, you actually have some meat on your bones. So it is nice to see her improve in, in that way. Mm -hmm. And it's, it is her story. Um, and Elias is very much just, you know, the secondary uh, to it. A lot of it is about her development as a mage. Um, as, you know, she learns how to do certain things and it quickly becomes about her gradual development and just gathering the things that can, you know, complete that for her, like get, uh, getting a familiar, uh, getting a, a staff, uh, learning how to do different things, learning how to prepare potions and cast spells and about how her powers work. Um, and it's, this is very much like, don't be mistaken about the type of series that this is. This is, despite the more kind of, I don't know what the right adjective is. I thought going into this that this was going to be much, much more of a, rom of a romance series. And it is not. It is a just a very kind of soft, slower sort of shonen adventure series. Um, it's, you know, about them going to, you know, complete certain tasks as uh, with uh, with Elias and coming across different villains and having to defeat them and about Chisei's development uh, as, as uh, they do so. Also, um, this uh, the series, Chris, has has a dog that I like. Um, <laughs> what? Yeah, you found one. <laughs> I found one. You can call I, off I really, the hunt. I like I like Ruth, um, mostly because uh, they're very not dog like. <laughs> oh, he does. He doesn't just like take a shit and roll around in it. He's uh, just as dignified as a as a human bodyguard all the time. <laughs> I can't believe you don't love animals that do that. No. Why would I want? <laughs> Because they're silly boys who don't know anything, but they're good doggos. <laughs> they're like, shut up. I hate you. <laughs> I take back everything I said about your <laughs> new look. It's heartbreaking, though, because he's waiting for he's waiting for his uh, his sister to wake up. But she's in the ground and she won't wake up, Chris. Mm. That's sad. It is. And there's a lot of little sad stories in here. It's sort of uh, almost a little full metal alchemist esque. With a lot of I, had, I had so much of an FMA vibe coming off of this series at different points, especially the whole, you know, like girl turned into a chimera thing shortly after that point. I was like, huh, that, that rings a bell right it's all there. starting to add up. Wait, Maze, don't answer that phone. <laughs> <laughs> I swear, if they get to a point, it's like, now it is time to teach you about alchemy. So there is this powerful artifact called a philosopher's stone. Wait a minute. <laughs> <laughs> oh, fuck. I... All right, tangent, Nick. 
I, I, I've been playing this one game called The Alchemist Code on mobile. Okay. And it's all based on that, and there's a Philosopher's Stone in it, the Gate of Truth. What I fucking love is the name of the ki- kingdoms are all based on the seven deadly sins, but they're all really bad. So it's like, we are from the kingdom of Rathius, <laughs> and you of the Sloth Empire. <laughs> It's all like we from the bureaucratic republic of envy <laughs> would like to speak with like, you. There's a couple of things there. It's like, okay, I could see, you know, naming a kingdom, not even just in terms of like the name versions of those sins, but it's like I could see someone naming, you know, their kingdom after wrath, pride, even gluttony. You know, stuff like that. We are the kingdom of envy. We <laughs> like all those other kingdoms way more than we like ourselves. Our socks. This blows. <laughs> We're the kingdom of, I don't know, fucking sloth. I don't give a shit. <laughs> <laughs> we'll be there tomorrow. All right. We'll just fucking we'll rename it tomorrow. I just, I don't have time. Do you <laughs> Sleepy. <laughs> King of sloth. Gondor calls for aid. I'll get it tomorrow. He's like, <laughs> where are they going? Maybe. Nowhere. <laughs> what if I can need our help for? Uh, I'm going back to bed. <laughs> yeah. Set hard, fine. Sound the horns. Brr, it's like an entire barracks full of soldiers who are all hitting the snooze button. They're like, well, tomorrow! <laughs> tomorrow! We'll do it. I headache. I just, I can't. I'm just, I'm, I'm mental health day. <laughs> God. I honestly don't have too much else to say about the series. I did really like reading it. Um, it actually goes at a pace that I really like. It made me have kind of this sense of nostalgia because I haven't read a fantasy series like this in quite a while about a character, you know, just gradually finding out more and more about stuff. But in a way where each very small uh, adventure that they have is very interesting and engaging. Uh, it takes it has a bit of a slow, rough start, in my opinion. But once you get to honestly just through the first like five chapters or so, after that point, I think that it gets way, way more interesting. You learn stuff about how like everything in the in this in this series, you know, works a very slightly different way. Cats, uh, you know, for example, are a species that have a, a role in the magical world because as they go through their nine lives, they actually become more intelligent and more uh, powerful. Um, There's a sad cat death I wasn't prepared for, Nick. Well, you know, it was for it was for happy reasons, Chris. I know, and... but <laughs> cats dying it's it's heartbreaking, Nick. I was and like, what if fluffy? What if Liam was on his ninth life? I mean, I'd be really bummed because that cat was dumb as shit. But man, what if Liam was there, Nick? <laughs> it's like Liam can talk now, but he's just like, ah, feed me back. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just like zombie, Liam. No. Also, Tier Nano got 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 a reference in this series, and I was immediately like, "God damn!" It, I just remembered that really weird Fox Kids show about knights that wanted to be Power Rangers. <laughs> Come on, Chris, don't you remember Mystic Knights of Tier Nano? <laughs> I know the name. It's it's right up there with like Wuya Knights or whatever that yeah. like the marionette puppet show they had on like Toonami for the bit. They're like the kids will love this. You know what Power Rangers always been missing? Puppet based action. <laughs> like, fuck, man. I admire you for trying. Um, but for this that series, was like a year before Team America was just like. Eh. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, I will say to this series that while it's not my cup of tea, it's one that I still definitely enjoyed. I think you can come into it and there are some oddities to it, but a lot of it you can just kind of be brushed aside as. You know, that's what the genre is kind of about. Um, if, if you ever get the chance, Lindsay Ellis, uh, some might know her as the nostalgia chick, has been doing video essays on YouTube. And one that she did that was really excellent was uh, this sort of apology to Stephanie Meyer for the way Twilight was received. And a large part of kind of that video was kind of discussing how people shit on Twilight. And it's not nearly as bad as what people are giving it as much hatred as they are for it you know it's sort of just that's the genre in a lot of ways there are faults within it certainly and i think that's the same here true um but ultimately it it just may not be the thing for you 
And that's kind of where I got here, you know. I There's stuff I could point out as being like, this is weird, or this is kind of creepy, or whatever. But a lot of it, I'm just like, fuck it. Just have your romance with your creepy skeleton deer man, and just go with it. You're not hurting anybody. Go wild. You do you, alright? If your fucking kink is to be sold into slavery to some fucking Salvador Dali-looking motherfucker, you go for it. I, I'm all for it, goddammit. Thank you for that endorsement, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think it's a, I think it's a decent series. It's just I don't think I'll be reading any more of it or or watching it or anything like that. But you know, I, I think it's still a perfectly good series. I thought that it was it was engaging enough and consistently engaging enough that I would have been like, if there were some right way of like actually you know like getting a sign of simulpub with this series, then I would think that I would actually consider like trying to get it on the on on the recap. But there isn't, so. <laughs> That's not going to work. Makes sense as a monthly series. And also it's picked up by what's like seven C's. And I think they don't actually typically do the silent pub stuff. So, oh, well, sadly, but you can still, uh, you can still catch all the episodes on uh, Crunchyroll if you have it. Yes. Uh, I I dig it. And, um, if you guys want to check out, uh, ancient Manager's bride for yourself. Yeah. You can check out the anime on Crunchyroll. You can also, uh, read the manga. I think the most recent volume actually dropped just a couple of days ago, like a week ago or something. So. All right. All right. Good. So let's go ahead and get into our usual manga, the recap portion of weekly manga recap. We're going to start as we normally do with my hero academia. Uh, do we want to do, like, Boruto after Food Wars, you think? I don't want to the fuck. I don't care. You do whatever <laughs> Nick, Nick, I don't. You do it when you want. It's, you know. Number 172. Prepping for the school festival is the funnest part. Part one. Chris, I have huge news. Okay. The longest chapter title this week was not We Never Learned. What? Someone it beat it? It was this. <laughs> oh, wow. That's it, awesome. Just, like, squeaks by with that... One at the end. <laughs> uh, Suiga is going to be like, "Fuck no! I must reclaim my crown." Sometimes a genius pursues an investigation of an ignorant X. Part one X times four. <laughs> Part one. I'm like, wait. So which is an X and which is a multiplying sign? Shush! <laughs> I use an asterisk. Oh, jeez. So uh, we get more of the uh, planning of the school festival, uh, particularly the uh, the band uh, that they need to do uh, with Jira, of course, at the center planning stuff. Her hands get drawn in a re- really weird way, actually, on this page because they're at, you know, uh, atypical angles for uh, this series. So her, one of her hands looks kind of weird. This is very much one of those, like, I took a picture and I drew based off of the picture as opposed to drawing in my normal style, it looks like. Um, but uh, essentially they're like, OK, well, you know, we've got we need we, we've got, you know, we need synths. So, yeah, uh, Yayorozu, sure, you can uh, you can play that because she has the you know, piano training. Um, Ashido is like really upset about this because she's like, you were going to be part of the girl's dance squad though, but I forgive you because you're so cute. She's been demented in this entire arc and it just continues in this chapter. I I wouldn't say demented. She's just been far more active than she has ever been before. Like normally this would be like her one line per arc. And now she's like every week, she's got like seven or eight scenes. Like they're definitely, I wonder if there's a reason for it, or if it's just like I want to fucking Ashido get get more of a spotlight. Like so the same way, kind of Kirishima has been slowly like acclimated as being like a big part of the group. They're like now it's Ashido's turn. Possibly, it's, and, and it's not that she's showing up more for me. It is literally just that every time that she's showing up, she's like, oh! <laughs> <laughs> yeah, she's got a lot more energy than she used to. Which we'll get to more in a little bit. So. Ida brings up the fact that um, if they just have, you know, the band members and and then everyone else is dancers, I don't know how that's going to work. And uh, Todoroki's like, yeah, in that video we watched, there were some more. And I was just like, we need props! And she, you know, shows like, yeah, there needs to be this stuff for a stage and a disco ball. And 
Um, they start throwing out more weird ideas like uh, uh, he, I oh is is Hagakure. Okay. I always have trouble with her name because I because it starts off similar to Hatsume, but yeah, Hagakure is like we can make it like a Disneyland parade. Like, do you know like what your budget is, kids? <laughs> That'd be great. She's like, we'll license all the popular Disney characters: Elsa, Mickey Mouse, Sora from Kingdom Hearts, uh, Captain America, Darth Vader. She's like, shit, this is gonna be a price. The most, the most popular character from every series under the Disney umbrella. <laughs> They're like, this, this, Woody. Like, they get ready to the festival on, and then like Mickey Mouse himself shows up to deliver their cease and desist. <laughs> He's like, I better get out of there. Huh? I'm gonna have to beat some asses if you don't talk, take these things down. Superheroes or not, I'll fuck a bitch up. <laughs> That's what it is. His quirk is that he's just Mickey Mouse. <laughs> <laughs> I don't need a quirk to whoop your ass there. <laughs> you think I haven't survived a few explosions in my time? Oh my gosh. So, Ashido says, I know what we could do. Uraraka could make Todoroki and Kirishima float, and then Kirishima could chop up Todoroki's ice. And if Aoyama acts as our disco ball, the sparkling ice will look like Stardust. I call it Team Snowman. <laughs> her eyes are going insane in this moment. <laughs> it's like this is her plan to take over the world or something. <laughs> yeah, she's like, and with it, the Russian coalition will be helpless. <laughs> That is not the look of someone's like, this is going to be so cool. That's the look of like, and then they'll all pay for making fun of me. <laughs> okay. And <laughs> at first I thought that Aoyama was going to be like, I have an objection about this because you're just, you're saying I'm going to swing from the rafters as the disco ball. What the fuck is that? But then he just goes, sip on. It's like, no, apparently he's fine with that. Yeah, like, no, okay. of course he is. Of course he's happy with being a giant spinning disco ball. I'll be so glittery and shiny and all the eyes will be on me. It's like, okay, I guess that and makes I can, sense. I can drop frozen blocks of cheese on everybody. <laughs> <laughs> Everyone open your mouths. <laughs> no, 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 not for you. You don't get any. <laughs> Spit that one out and throw it at the person next to you. <laughs> You're not allowed to swallow that. <laughs> okay. And then... What is wrong with everyone in this panel, Chris? Everyone is breathing smoke from their nostrils, except for Deku. <laughs> They're all very relieved. And also well, trains. Like, we're done with extra lessons, so what a relief. <laughs> They're all trains, Nick. Didn't you catch that shoot, in the last shoot. chapter? <laughs> okay so Uraka as they step in uh, brings up hey so are you going to be singing Jiro and Jiro's like no no I cannot do that no 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 Uh, immediately a number of people step in like I want to sing so Mine is like singers get all the chicks Um, and um no, it, 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 they're all outrageously weird in very different ways. <laughs> I, we all have to be honest. Kirishima's is by Kirishima far the best. Be best. <laughs> I don't even get what genre they think he is because he's like Brotherhood Between Dudes season all. I'm like, what genre is that supposed to be? I've listened to a lot of music and has there been like a dude not- jam <laughs> high fame high five your dudes like in that blunt of a way? It's gotta be like anime opening music or something like that the way he's singing i'm thinking of it like a papa roach but i'm trying to think of like a papa roach song that's just like got all my friends here together we're gonna party hard and be bros (laughs) (laughs) giving high fives making lots of jokes because they're best friends and always gonna be oh it's a crush 40 song nick he's just doing crush 40 (laughs) i got it (laughs) makes sense now sorry I, i had to sing it to get to it uh, Mineta just kind of seemingly just death growls, I guess. I think like, ah! And uh, um, Yama does falsetto. So, yeah. But everyone eventually just is just like, you should just sing, Jiro. In particular, Hagakure is like, your singing was super duper cool when you were teaching us before. And so Jiro finally sings. 
And um, everyone's like, yeah, you should be the, yes, that was very good. And I can totally feel how great she is with this non-audio medium to hear it through. Well, here's the thing. You could portray this, I think, a little bit better if you were a bit more clear with what's supposed to happen. Because the moment she sang, it's not a moment where I was like, oh, hold on. This makes a lot of sense. For, like, that initial page, I was like, oh, is she really bad and loud? And that's what's knocking them over? Because that's what my first thought is. You see the three of them getting knocked backwards. And I was like, huh? And they're like, oh, I guess because they say it's unanimous, she's good. And that's the direction they're going. I think it was just kind of weirdly presented, especially since Jiro is not a character who's gotten a ton of spotlight before this. So the idea of her being, like, extremely shy and not really willing to go out there and put herself out like that. And then being like, oh, she has the voice of an angel. Just, like, it's hard to get that across. Mm-hmm. And who gives a fuck? Because then to- <laughs> Tokoyami shows up. And- <laughs> okay, right, well, yeah. <laughs> I, I do actually I do like the single panel of her singing because not because you get the impression that, oh, she's really great, but because you get the impression of how shy she is about it. And that carries through really well. And she really moves on past that really, really quickly. And she's just like, oh, good, thanks. It's like, guitarist, I need guitarist. Everyone shut up. Um, so Kaminari and Minato are being like, let's do that. And uh Kaminari, um, but Kir- I like Hiroshima's reaction because you know they they were going to sing and he and he was just like I'd probably break the strings. Uh, yeah, you probably would. Makes sense. Uh, Kaminari seems to be all set to go, but Mineta, the guitar is too big for him, so he's just like I can't reach the strings thanks to my design. <laughs> That's like a fourth wall moment. He's like, why wasn't I designed with more arm to body ratio? <laughs> Why don't they just get you a smaller guitar, me data? <laughs> <laughs> and then Sokoyami picks up the cast aside guitar, and everyone's like, "What? What? Oh, wow! You can play? Why did you say so, Tokoyami?" And Tokoyami says, "And I quote: I set the axe aside after the F chord defeated me." By far, though, the best line is him saying, Mineta, if your journey ends here, I'll strum enough for the two of us. As though Mineta was dying. And he's like, Your choice, oh. your choice, Bucko. Like, I'm like, there is nothing more perfect than for Tokoyami to be the angsty guitarist of this group. You couldn't have like designed a better decision than that. I fucking love how hard in they've gone with Tokoyami as just this super emo loser. <laughs> At first, he's just an emo. He's just a fucking dork. <laughs> <laughs> like, it started off, he was just a dude with a bird head who's like, I have trouble controlling my powers. And then slowly but surely, he's just like, how about we feast at the banquet of eternal darkness, my friends? <laughs> how many video games do you think that this guy owns? <laughs> <laughs> and I'm he like, like always has like the same character design for his for his make a character, yeah. Which is not bird themed at all. For he's some like, reason. I need long black hair. Uh, I need long leather robes. <laughs> leather robes. <laughs> he's like, it's the only it's the only fabric that fits me that speaks to my soul. <laughs> It is the only fabric that can contain my inner darkness. <laughs> I fuck. I love this dude. He's so great. I, he's like the dude who's like every time he logs into Overwatch, he's just like a plain Reaper. They're like, well, we already <laughs> we already have enough DPS. He's like, I'm Tank Reaper. Then <laughs> like that's not really a thing, but I just go for it. I, I'll switch. He, he always, whenever he logs onto a game, he always like greets everyone with his own self-made catchphrase, which is never like the catchphrase that could be a default in the game. It's like something that he makes up that he thinks is really clever. Die well beneath the moon tonight, my friends. Everyone's <laughs> like, what? Oh my god. It's, it, oh my god. It, Get out of trade, dickhead! <laughs> oh no, crap. It's Warrior of the Darkness 0101. <laughs> He's like, I'm glad to know me and my other hundred brothers are still fighting the fight. He actually tried every every iteration <laughs> from 1 to 101 so he could have Warrior of Darkness. But he still was smart enough to check to make sure that there was a zero first before. So he, he was preparing himself for the incremental jump to a thousand if he needed to. <laughs> Oh, man. 
I love Tokoyami. He is the best character in that series. Now that we've spent five years on this one line. <laughs> Mineta is really depressed. And he's just like, I can't wait for the stupid festival to end. And Ashido is like, hey, Mineta, if you be part of the dance team, I'll there could be a part of it where you get a harem. He's like, I can't wait for this festival to start. I feel like we shouldn't encourage him, but... Yeah, that was a very strange moment of yours, Ashido. I was like, oh, I feel bad for the little pervert. Let's get him a moment where he gets surrounded by girls who are going yeah. to be grinding on him. He, he he deserves it at this point. I feel bad for this guy. I'll leave one of my bras in your locker for you later on. Like, that's, I don't know. It's you know? so me that Austin is all right with his arrangement. <laughs> He's like, oh, hell yeah, I'll burn her down. Oh. <laughs> his head gets stuck to the back of the desk. He's like, oh, shit, I went too far back. <laughs> Someone help me, Nada Cold! <laughs> uh, I'm so apparently they were up planning the festival until one in the morning, and apparently Ida was the only one actually doing any work because, Jesus Christ, man, <laughs> go to bed. His eyes look like he burned them. <laughs> His circles have circles have circles. Um, so yeah, we just get this brief little recap of like, okay, this is, you know, the, the, what everyone's been separated up into. We've got the dance squad, we've got the staging team, we've got the band. Um, and I'm super he, pumped for this band, by the way, that band's pretty dope. I do like the, uh, the, the poses that everyone's doing. Also, is Ida taking a selfie? He looks like he's taking a selfie. Uh, he might be? I, I can't tell because it feels like a couple people are not aware of this then. Because <laughs> there's yeah. a couple people... Also, he also, he has that, you know, tendency to just kind of, uh, you know, with his arms. So Yeah. Uh, okay. So, uh, they've done all that stuff. Um, but the next day, Deku, Deku is... gets a long range attack. All right, let's go back to talk about Tokoyami and <laughs> that great line. <laughs> It's a pretty, it's actually a pretty long conversation, so let's not go all the way through it. So he talks with Toshinori. Uh, he has something to tell him about his power, so they take him out. And he takes him out into the forested area in the school grounds, and he's like, "Okay, try try launching an attack while you're doing this." And it launches a wind pressure can, and so he's like, "You just didn't realize that you know you've reached a point where you can actually fire off a blast of air pressure without hurting yourself." So. You know, you can combine techniques to do that thing you would do before where you would flick your fingers and cause a huge explosion. You can do that now without hurting yourself, which means you can have a long distance attack. That's the point of their conversation. And it is easily the least interesting part of the entire of the entire chapter. Which is weird because uh, it's a very significant one. It's, it's an shown in wise. It's like long standing effects part of this arc so far is that Deku can actually, you know, fight someone at long range. Um but the chapter ends from there. Aizawa and uh, and Mirio are escorting uh, Eri to the to the school. So. Yay! I hope only good things happen to her. Yes. The <laughs> first thing she does is trip an ice cream. I'm like, well, I'm gonna I'm gone from this arc, Nick. I can't do it. All right. We're, we're doing Boruto now. Uh, we might as well. <laughs> All right, Boruto time. Yes, Boruto. Yes. Number 21. How you use it. And an X with us, you can... All right, I, I wish it was just longer, too. Uh, Al looks really off-model in this picture, I have to say. His head looks enormous. Oh, that's a bobblehead. Yeah. Okay, that's... it's not the real Al. Good. Yeah, Good it's just a, just a bobblehead. You're going to see the price tag underneath his foot if you look really closely. Last time in Boruto, they were all planning on taking on Ao, and Boruto was like, we can do this! I have a lightsaber! And this chapter basically begins with him being like, oh right, this Jane Shocker really, really fast. <laughs> um, so, and Serata's like, talk about a double-edged sword! He's like, yeah, yeah, very funny. Thank you. Yes, literal double-edged sword. Yes, get it. Yes, yes. Um, also, Katasuke uh, brings up Hey, just so you know, like, I mean, it's there's no way of getting around the fact that this thing drains chakra really, really fast. So that's why it's not it doesn't really have actually much use in combat. 
this isn't a video game. You know, there aren't any cheats here. And it, it occurred to me immediately when I read that, I was like, Boruto is exactly the type of guy who every time he plays a video game, he gets all the cheat codes ready. So he has like infinite lives, infinite ammo. If he needs, if he really needs to, he'll just, you know, hit a single button and everyone dies. He can just do that as many times as he wants. Oh, he's he just, like, he has a ninjutsu game shark, basically. Yeah. It's like, video games aren't fun if you can't win every time. <laughs> So wait, he is Infamous Planet. Because <laughs> Infamous Planet will have this argument with you. He, when he plays Skyrim, the first thing he does, he removes, like, carrying capacity. Because he's like, why would I want to be bothered to have an inventory system? <laughs> I think that some games could be incredibly helped by getting rid of that, honestly. <laughs> they definitely could. But Infamous has a very specific way of playing every game that I feel like he is bored to at heart. Which makes a lot of sense for the way things went in the uh, radio play. Al talks a lot to the, one of the guys in the masks that was in that evil secret society group thing. Um, they talk about how Al needs to shut himself off from emotions. And I was like, I'm a machine. I'm a machine. Okay. I am just a tool now. He wanders off looking for the, everyone, uh, realizes that they're hiding, shoots an arm cannon. He's got a lot of stuff that can come out of his fucking arm, doesn't he? Guns. Yeah, he's like, he's iron. Arms. Um, so everyone jumps out in order to attack him. Uh, they start launching a bunch of jutsu at him immediately. Misaki has lightning, and Konohamaru has, like, fireball attacks, and Sarada tries to punch him and then uses, you know, Sasuke's signature kind of fire-breathy technique. Um, and everyone just, like, just keeps on launching these jutsus at him while he just, you know, uses the jutsu absorption gauntlet thing to, to absorb them all, and uh, he's safe, and he's just thinking to himself as this is going on. This is the most transparent, you know, strategy ever. Like, that Boruto kid hasn't jumped out yet. And so he must be waiting in the wings while I'm distracted to try and attack me from my blind spot. Either attack me from behind or attack me from above. And sure enough, Boruto comes, you know, comes jumping in. He slashes the lightsaber down uh, on top of Al. But Al reveals his two, his Darth Maul extension thing, blocks the attack, and then... Spins around, knocks the sword out of Barto's hands, grabs it, and stabs it through the fucking gut. Day. So they killed Boruto. Boruto, oh. our six generations, not starring Boruto. <laughs> Stay tuned for Boruto Two, Naruto's second son. Boruto. <laughs> They're like, well, what about your daughter? You're like, eh. She's Hanada. She looks too much like Hanada. No one's going to follow her. No one's going to have to. <laughs> and what, I was just like, what oh, I... <laughs> So Alice just says, I saw through the whole thing. I'm the smartest. And Barto's like, ha, yeah, right. And he grabs onto Al's hands to hold the to hold his, his hands over the lightsaber. Mitsuki comes in, extends his stretchy arm thing. Uh, around it so that uh, again Al can't let go and then Boruto vanishes because he was a shadow clone what no way but Boruto didn't die (laughs) wait hold on hold on Nick someone suffered what appeared to be fatal damage and then turns out they were just a clone that doesn't happen in Naruto no no never you must be thinking of We Never Learn. That's where it's a big thing. So the point of this whole thing was to actually trick Ao into picking up the lightsaber and trying to use it so that they could just force him to hold on to it as it would forcefully drain his chakra in order to power itself. And so that has actually done a lot more good than actually trying to attack him with it would have ever caused. Um, Boruto comes in to follow up. He's got his Rasengan ready. Al tries to absorb it, but Boruto also has a Jutsu Absorption Gauntlet, so the two cancel each other out, and then he manages to uh, nail uh, Al in the arm with his Rasengan and knock him backwards, and that's where the chapter ends. It's a decent chapter. I think it seems like this is a pretty cool fight. I imagine this is something that if the anime does it, it'll be a pretty cool like exchange and fight to kind of dig into. Mm-hmm. So I'm all over it that way. 
Yeah, but it, it was not bad. But eh. it doesn't actually seem that the wrestling god did very much because they were like, yeah, this is our chance. And then he just, eh. Well, knocked him backwards. He doesn't actually look all that hurt by it. Yeah. Oh, well. We shall see. Still seems like it was good. Uh, I guess now we'll head over to Food Wars. <laughs> Boy, this whole this whole round last went pretty quickly, didn't it? <laughs> I feel like after, yeah, I guess it did actually, because I was thinking like, oh wait, no, the first of this round was Arena versus Momo, and that was pretty yeah. quick. Yeah, this whole thing went like a month or something. Uh, it's chapter two hundred fifty-two, final battle. Uh, so Rindo is the first one to present her dish uh, to the new panel of judges. Um, but Takumi is also playing at basically the exact same time. Uh, they're both ready to go. Uh, so uh, Takumi's dish is calamari, squid stuffed with savory filling and baked to juicy perfection in the oven. Okay, good to know. It's, it's all Mediterranean-y. Gotcha. Uh, then there's Rindo's, which looks like a cake, despite having the squid element of it. Um, so they try out Tsukumi's first. Um, what is her name? Fucking. Oh, uh, honesty. Something like that. It was something. It was like an like a, just like a virtue or something like that. <laughs> Courage, wasn't it? Courage, I think. So, yeah. Courage, right? It was She's one like, of nah, it was nah, one nah, of the nah. crests. My boobs. <laughs> All right, so <laughs> I gotta say, I'm <laughs> I'm torn on whether or not this theme of judging this time around is over the top glorious like Food Wars tends to be, or if it's it, it's gone past that too far and it's just like you've just gone to straight weird territory here. <laughs> It's like that sequence where, you know, we're in Family Guy, where Peter and the Patriots pour him to poopy. It's like the idea is that it's like it's funny and then it keeps going and like uh, and then it just becomes funny again. But there's a point beyond that where it becomes end this now. Um, so I get your point. <laughs> it, it's that moment when you're just like, all right, so they gauge the deliciousness of food this time. Based on the, I guess, sluttiness of clothes that they will then wear. I don't. I was so confused as to how this grading system works because they start off in sexy lingerie. Um. To if you ever need to explain to someone the fan service in Food Wars, in three words, just say calamari lingerie collection <laughs> because that's what this chapter is about they both had to use you know calamari in you know squid in their in their dish and it's portrayed as being like sexy girls wearing lingerie what's the what's the checkpoint pointing to what che checkpoint I don't they, know. they both say checkpoint I guess it's not supposed to point to anything. I think that it's just pointing to the clothing. Because the first two are pointing directly at Courage's boob. But the others are the other one is just like pointing at the general nightgown. So I guess it's just the lingerie itself. I'm just I'm trying to figure out if the checkpoint's supposed to mean anything. Because it seems like it was almost drawn in. It's designed like a lingerie advertisement. So Is it? Is this how they design lingerie? I can only assume that in terms of the way that they're that they, that is talk the description is done, and and, the, and it's it, it, all of this description by the way on this has nothing to do with the actual dish itself. It's it's you know just talking about you know like I'll I'll read a little bit of it just uh, this sexy th see through camisole and cayenne pepper red includes deliciously feminine silk embroidery. Occasionally, a few descriptive words like referencing squid or seasoning or whatever. Are I was going to say, it. is cayenne it's, it's pepper red? Like, check out how check out how sexy the, this piece of this piece of clothing looks. They draw the eye, eye to the bust line and show off your natural curves. Like, <laughs> I was like, is cayenne pepper even a kind like a shade of red? I have never heard of that used as a, like a shade of red before. Cayenne pepper red. 
So the girls have this reaction to it, and Azami is just like, hmm, that was good. Anyway. <laughs> I fucking, I love that they have this full page spread about, like, this food was so delicious, it was like a negligee commercial. Azami's like, all right, it was pretty good. Give me the next one. <laughs> like, I'm like, Azami needs to always be the judge of these things. He was like, that was good. Next dish. That was better. You win. <laughs> Rindo's is better. It's so good that it's not just like lingerie on a sexy girl. Even a girl without a voluptuous figure like Une feels like she has a voluptuous figure. Who the fuck it's... thinks Ume is not voluptuous? That chick's rack is enormous. No, Chris, the point is that she's drawn bustier in this new ne- in this new lingerie commercial. <laughs> I still feel as though voluptuous would have been a fine adjective to describe Ume with before this. If you put Ume next to Fumino, then it then it'd be just like, oh yes, I can totally see how you feel flat chested. <laughs> sure. I love like in this whole thing, uh, you know, with this with these weird you know commercial stuff. There's this brief moment where they talk about Rindo and her secret ingredient, the Piraruku. A very rare ingredient, which is a type a, a white fet, fish, and so we're just like I'm friends with the guy who breeds them here in Japan. I fish them straight out of the Amazon more than once myself, and just like her and her adventure uniform, in her adventure uniform, going Woo! <laughs> carrying this eel over her head. <laughs> Fair enough, it makes sense. Like, oh, Rindo, you're the best. <laughs> yeah, I like that. I love that enthusiasm. <laughs> and yes, it's. It's a, it's like a flavor that could transform a person with only a single bite. An experience that could take even the flabbiest of bodies and whip it into perfect shape. Which is signified by me doing sit-ups on top of a Piraruku-shaped exercise ball. <laughs> the match is over, thank God. Rindo wins. <laughs> I love it wasn't even another chapter to be like, well, let's see about the next dish. It was just like, boom, it's done. <laughs> okay. Yeah, see, so, so Takumi, your dish was like if a sexy girl wore lingerie, but Rindo's was like if a not as sexy girl wore lingerie and looked even sexier than she normally does. That's how good Rindo's dish is. Finally, Food Wars explained in a way that me, the common man, can understand it. <laughs> Emphasis on the man. <laughs> oh, gosh. So, even, yeah, it's a unanimous decision in favor of, of uh, Takumi. Even Une is just like, yes. Yes, that, that that was the better dish, uh, and uh, but Rindo gives a little bit of uh, a, a compliment to Tsukumi, you know, very kind of shonen, uh, you know, like hey, that was a good match, but it looks like I won, kind of thing. Um, yeah, but Takumi says, "I put all the skill and talent I have on into that dish. However, today you were the better chef." But on a different note, uh, hey, why are you so afraid? And Rindo gets this big reaction shot where it, she looks unlike any time we've seen her previously because she looks very, you know, vulnerable and innocent uh, in it, despite her slit pupil and fang teeth. But even so, she looks very open in this one moment before she just goes, You idiot, shut up, I'm not afraid! <laughs> and then she runs away. <laughs> I love how she speaks to someone t- like two years her junior as kids these yeah, days are just a bunch, bunch of smart mouth punks. You know what? Though, here's the thing. When you're 17, 18, two years is a substantial time in your life. Because I can remember when I was graduating high school and I was seeing freshmen. I was like, freshmen today are so tiny and small. They look like fifth graders still. And you're like, oh, it looks like I could pick them up and put them in my backpack. (laughs) Yeah, I'm going to take a couple of you kids. You're coming home with me. I'm going to throw you at things. And you're just like, no, just because you're fucking 18 years old. You have no scale for this. And and you've learned how to grow really shitty looking facial hair. (laughs) Are you 18, Chris? Oh, okay. No, it's not me. You're talking about you. Okay. It's going to be 18, though. (laughs) Can I go back to being 18? Um, I wouldn't mind being 18 again with all the knowledge that I have today. I would make different decisions. <laughs> um, 
So, th- it's down to two on two in the team Shokugeki. The fifth battle is going to take place the next day between Sukasa and Rindo and Arena and Soma. Uh, and so, some people, I believe it's the uh, MC who is discussing this, and she's like, "So obviously, if one if one team wins both bouts, then that's going to be the end of it. But it could be a split, and so there might be a sixth bout after out, bout afterwards that could determine the final winner." But then all of a sudden Senzemon says, no, there will be no sixth bout. The upcoming fifth bout will be the final battle of the Shokugeki. It is the final bout. He's like, this shit needs to end. This arc's been forever. It's been going on for like a year. This is ridiculous. (laughs) My feet hurt. So... Perhaps this has something to do with his agreeing to let Azami be on the judge board. Maybe it was some sort of a deal they struck. But uh, I don't know. So it seems as though this final bout is actually going to be run by different rules. Maybe it's the best overall combination of dishes is going to win and that's it. No individual match. But I guess we'll see. I am, I am curious to see because it, it does throw a loophole and some things. But more than anything, at least I'm glad because it does... Sh- place Erin in a prominent role then. My my biggest worry is she would get saddled going up against Rindo and or or, or she'd go up against Tsukasa and lose just to to give that final one-on-one with Soma. So I like that it, it she's she's in the final match no matter what because this is the final one. Mm-hmm. It is possible that this could be the out for them managing to defeat Tsukasa because Tsukasa's thing has always been that he has absolute confidence only in himself. Uh, and if Rindo is, you know, vulnerable in this moment, then that could be their chance to defeat Sukasa without ever actually having to face him individually one on one. Which, if that happens, that gives me the impression that this is not the final arc, definitely. I don't because that means, it's not. Because that would mean that it's like, well, then Soma didn't ever beat Sukasa one on one, and that seems very finale ish to me. So, so, um, yeah, it was a weird little chapter, um, but one that I'm not surprised to see come out of Food Wars. Um, but in terms of the way that it actually affects the match, it was just kind of like, oh, Tsukumi, you are going to try and find the weakness. And what is the weakness in Rindo's heart? It's like, no, no, he won't be the one to do that. <laughs> it's just another chance for Rindo to, to, to be amazing. So, All right. Uh, well, that out of the way, it is time for Doctor Stone, Chris. What time is it? What time is it? Eight forty-nine. Yes. It's time to get Stone. I'm in this series too. I'm here too. All right, let me see here. Doctor Stone. Z equals forty-seven. Science versus power. Uh, so, previous chapter, Senku managed, and everyone managed to drive off Tsukasa's goons by faking that they had guns. And so they run away. Uh, they immediately haul up, uh, Kinro, and meanwhile, well, rather, Kohaku hauls, uh, Kinro up to safety, and while well, Kinro is going, Ah, Kinro's dead! <laughs> and Kin- Kinro says, don't kill me off yet, I'm still alive. <laughs> Don't do this to me, man. Fortunately, uh, Senku has some medicine left over from the creation of the sulfonamide panakia, uh, and he just like throwing medicine into the wound. <laughs> he just like he just like puts a funnel in his mouth, pours it, in, and then just slaps shit on the rest of. Him. He's like done. Yeah. And tomorrow you'll be good as new. And Chrome is just Chrome and Crocker are like really? He'll be as good as new tomorrow. And so a little bit of time passes. And then the next day, Kinro is coming down the ladder from his hut. I'm as good as new. <laughs> and then, no, he's not. He's he's still heavily wounded. Like, I'm fine. <laughs> I, love, I love that joke. It's like, there's no way he'll be as good as new tomorrow. I'm as good as new. <laughs> um, but Kinro refuses to stay down because, ah, honor and duty and all that stuff. But, uh, Senku says, like, hey, you know, we've got to be alert and vigilant and we've got to get stuff going uh, because they could be back at any moment. We cut away to uh, Gen, Gen uh, hanging out with uh, Hyoka and his goons. 
Um, one of the not as good members of their group just like, die, I'm angry! Uh, Gen is there, of course, to kind of gently prod them to do uh, stuff the way that would benefit the Kingdom of Science the most. Um, Yoga, meanwhile, has everything kind of you know figured out but by this point. Uh, he's he says like, hey, you know, th- this battle took a, you know turned around the moment we learned that Senku was alive, so we need to actually take this seriously. Let's actually go back to Sukasa and you know get a proper attack squadron together before we head back and the big idiot guy is just like oh are you scared then well if if you didn't have that pipe spear or whatever it is then you would just be a scrawny idiot who can fight and again uh it's like what what do you mean pipe spear you've got this bit of bamboo bamboo attached to it i'm gonna check and he was like if you unless you want to die put it down so Um, I, I do appreciate that, you know, they've like called attention to the interesting design of that. I mean, I caught it in the previous chapter, but it's one of those things that if I weren't so into the series that I would have probably overlooked. So, um, so Hyoga considers things for a little bit, um, and he thinks to himself, Hey, you know, if we, if we do just turn around and go right to fight again, Maybe it would work, and if it works, then, you know, cool. But if it doesn't work and they're killed in battle, then it'll be a chance to learn what the Kingdom of Science can do. These guys are just disposable idiots anyway. So, (laughs) Sukasa recruited this guy, you say? (laughs) I don't see how. I never would have guessed that he would go along with his ways of doing things. Oil and water over here or something, yeah. Um, meanwhile, uh, back in the kingdom of science, Kinro has glasses now. Also, apparently he got a haircut. His hair looks different to me. Well, that's because he is a handsome boy now, Nick. This is where all the fangirls have their panties melt. Yes. I bet that's actual reality. I bet a lot of women, like, you know, people who were like, this dude's fucking hot now. And sploosh. Well, you know, it's like a tidal it's wave. It's not just he doesn't just have glasses, Chris. He's doing the anime glasses guy thing, where like, mm, you know. I bet if Annalise were here right now, she'd be like, "Yum, he's scrum diddly umptious." <laughs> if we had Jeff here, he's like, "That dude's hotterific." <laughs> hotterific. And if we had Infamous here, he'd be like, "Oh, it's so like to splunk that guy's Big Ben, Pip Pip." <laughs> As Miz does, where he forgets the shape of general <laughs> British landmarks in his sexual innuendos. That's like his thing. I'm gonna double decker his parliament, I will. Bangers and mash. Bip, bip. <laughs> I'm gonna lie me his stone hand, I will. <laughs> He's like, I'm gonna brick shit house his chimney sweep, I will. You're gonna poop in his mouth? What does that mean? <laughs> <laughs> oh gosh. <laughs> Nailed it. Okay. So, uh, Suika also, by the way, has a, a helmet with, you know, the prescription lenses in it. Uh, so Suika's just like, yeah, you know, Suika feels comfortable in it still. So, that's nice. But Suika's just like, we've got to make more preparations now! Um, he calls all of the village together. And uh, so everyone is going to you know, bring up their concerns. Like, Kohaku is like, hey, what about that guy with the mask? He seemed like he was a really skilled fighter. What the hell are we going to do about him? Senku, uh, let's see, says, let's see. Uh, he Senku says that they're actually going to make something that Gen wanted us to make, even though it was back at the time he first suggested it, it was kind of ahead of their line of progress. Senku talks to the um, craftsman who is so excited over the design idea that his clothes burst off food war style. He just goes, run, 
So, uh, thanks for that shot of muscular old man ass, Boichi. Thanks for that. Thank God he didn't have an enormous dick like that was pixeled up beneath it. Because that's no, the real that's, worry. He's erect, so it's not hanging down between his oh, legs. Oh, shit. He's like, working on thing gets me so hard. I'm not even going to need a hammer now. <laughs> boom, boom, boom. <laughs> Ow, 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 ow. <laughs> I didn't think this through. Um, what is this time passes. Tsukasa's forces come back to attack again. Um, and uh, after a few days, basically the weather clears up so that they're good to go. And uh, yeah, Kyoko leads everyone in. Uh, more preparations are rushed out. Um, it looks like Senku has been caught on the bridge uh, and is vulnerable, but as uh, you know, he uh, stands there looking like he's going to be taken down. All of a sudden dashing up from around the cliff face are you know, everyone who can actually fight um, wielding katanas because Jesus Christ, <laughs> you sure made those fast. <laughs> Three days to make a bunch of katanas. Well, okay. <laughs> He's dick. He was so hard. Oh, God. I think he was ambling with his dick, too. Like, ow, it burns. Ow, it burns. Ow. It's, so his dick isn't the hammer. It's the hammer and the anvil. It's everything, yeah. <laughs> and the tongs. It's also the furnace that he gets the to heat. kiln. <laughs> I do like that they, that they have this badass uh, spread of uh, everyone wielding katanas in, you know, traditional Japanese kimonos and then there's just a little note that's like, no this is no this is just the impression that Zukasa's army has this is actually how they're dressed <laughs> that'd be great if he was like no we need traditional Japanese attires and my dick will be the sewing machine <laughs> <laughs> like you know what I don't want an old guy making my clothes and stuff anymore <laughs> oh gosh um yeah, so they made the, make the katanas, and there's a brief aside about how awesome katanas are. Um, and yes, katanas are pretty awesome because of certain reasons that I won't get into. But yes, uh, they completely outclass the weapons that these guys have because they're basically just stone tools. So, um, and yes, in the stone world of ours, they are far beyond the ultimate. Bl they are far beyond the ultimate blades of science. And Kinro attacks like two guys and breaks their weapons in one stroke. So, cool little chapter, but nice and quick. Yeah, I, I I enjoy the overzealous nerdiness in terms of like katanas are the best weapons. That's why they made them first. It's like yeah, sure, of course. Oh wait, hang on a second. <laughs> hang on, let's see here. Written by Richo Inagaki, art by Boichi. Special guest appearance author by Hashtag Ray. Oh, okay. <laughs> You're just like, oh, uh, it's a series written by a guy from Japan? Yeah, of course katanas are the best weapon then. <laughs> that would be like me making like a uh, manga on cars. And I'm like, well, we should make sure we get the best car model available. A Ford Charger, of course. <laughs> People are like, nah, I don't know about that, but sure, go with it. It's a cool car. I'm not saying it, but... uh yeah, no, I, I, I enjoy that. I, I like the, the imagery of them as, like, samurai warriors going into a fight. It's cool. If you're going for realism, which, of course, Dr. Stone always does, always has. Um, you wouldn't make a katana in this situation. You would make, like, a broadsword, depending on how much iron you actually had. But but I yeah. get it in way of particularly being cool. And also, again, it, it's it's a manga for children, so children mm -hmm. are going to think katanas are cool more than being like, it's an Eastern European broadsword, or... Quran, as the Celts used to call it before its design was adapted across it. You'd be like, well, in this true strategic warfare, you'd want to build pikes first and then station off warriors with crossbows across the yarn. 40 paces out, no less. <laughs> Fuck this. Just they built swords. Uh, your paces or my paces? We really need like a universal system of, me of measurement here. <laughs> Someone's like, how about feet? Someone's like, damn it! The stone world uses the shitty American system. 
But I do really love the, the you know, clash of technological progress that this makes. It's not just like one has entered into the Iron Age and the other is still in the Stone Age. It's like, no, we have katanas and you have stone axes. Fuck you. Yeah. <laughs> God, it's like you guys never even played the fucking weapon triangle from Fire Emblem, stupids. <laughs> we have nothing but light mages. Why would you come at us with dark mages? Stupid, stupid, stupid. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Oh, right. So, I had to, to get us into to We Never Learn. Yes. Uh, Question 52, Chris. Uh, and here we go. Yeah. Question 52. Sometimes a genius pursues the investigation of an ignorant ex. So, we are not in a Kirisu chapter this time. We're, we, no. We, it was, what, two chapters without... Or no, three chapters, I think, without Kirisu, because she wasn't in the Hot Springs episode, I don't think. Amazingly. Yeah, she well, she was in the cover page if that counts, but instead we get a Fumino chapter mm-hmm. as the one And it's girl... not about her breasts, Chris. It's I don't even think it's a joke mentioned within the chapter. It's astonishing. So instead, it's about the one girl in class who has kind of like an antagonistic friendly relationship with Fumino, who was scrolling through Instagram and finds a particular picture of her leaving the uh that that one in with Uega that happened a couple uh, probably like a month and a half ago or so uh she basically like spots her out in class and mentions how she was scrolling through instagram and then she saw a certain photo and we get this huge full page uh image of fumino seeing the image and her reaction face is spectacular like it's so enormous it's like murder eyes like a little tiny baby mouth (laughs) Uh, i love it and uh she's very very shocked by this she's of course explaining like oh no what was it that that was happening i promise Uh, and they're trying to find out apparently it's from some user on instagram who only has uh no followers and she decides to team with you really got to find out who this is so they can get that picture deleted before anyone else sees it so that's what the chapter goes on they have a single clue, and that is that the person posts a lot of different pictures of food based mm. on the captions. It seems to be written by a woman, and the name is Spieling. 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 Spieling with Spiel, love. Spieling. Spieling with Spielen. love. Uh, Brawl is going to be angry at us after this one. Germans, <laughs> unite your hatred against us. <laughs> They go to the music club to see if it's one of like the members of the music club, and they're like, "Oh no, it's not us." And that's when the sensei comes in, and she has brought dessert, and that's when they're like, "Oh wait, that dessert right there—that's the same for one of the Instagram pictures." And they always post it on the same day, and always from the same table, so it must be somebody who goes to the table on this particular day. So we'll stake out the restaurant. So that's what they go do. They're at the restaurant. I like how during this realization. Uh, when Fumino's like, all these desserts are those in the Instagram account. But when she's pointing out the desserts, she's just kind of like, ah, it's so good looking. <laughs> all these desserts are from there. Oh, I can't wait to eat them all. Uh, so they're waiting at the restaurant. I need to take all these desserts so that I can show you Ego. <laughs> <laughs> no, your diet. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> so, uh,. They're at the diner, and they're waiting, or restaurant, I should say, and Fumino has a moment of realization where she's like, wait a minute, this is the first time I've actually been alone with Yuega, basically, since that night. And she starts kind of drifting back to it, and remembering how they were, you know, sharing, like, basically a bed together, and the, the romantic moment of holding their hands, and she kind of just thinks out loud, she's like, this seems kind of like a date. And I like this exchange because Yuega's, of course, like, huh? And her way to get out of it she's like uh no that was another role playing expertise in fem- feminine fem- feminine psychology and he's like oh thanks <laughs> thanks sensei for teaching me this sometimes girls will just say that it's like we're on a date it- shut up <laughs> she's like impromptu lesson about girls go <laughs> uh but then one of uega's friends shows up and he's like oh hey if it's uega uh, what a coincidence and uh he's like mad if i join you and they're like nah sure go ahead and you're like oh okay it's someone to kind of interrupt this date and and basically be like well it's uh, uega's friend you know he's, yeah he was in chapter one chris he's his best friend but no i i, I like your immediate thought at least in my mind was like oh this guy's here to like 
make it so it's not going to be a single one-on-one -on -one encounter and she's going to feel like forlorn about that that maybe more of the friends will show up so while she's kind of like they're trying to figure out where this person is we Actually, see i just noticed something while we were going through this so omori says yay let's see will i have and if Amir just says you're funny omori I think maybe they didn't actually think he was here to order something. Maybe maybe he says it in a kind of sing-songy way that doesn't really carry across. I don't know. Maybe it's well, just his general enthusiasm. I don't know. Well, remember, because they, they noted that the reason they thought it was a, a woman was because of the way the comments were. So maybe he just has a very feminine maybe way. He's, he's like, yay, very, that's the yeah. one we're having. That or must like be that. it. That's got to be it. Because he, he, actually... also, he also has like a heart when he says like, wee. He takes like a heart <laughs> so they're looking around they're trying to find uh who this person is and while it's happening in the background you can see omori ordering a piece of cake taking a picture of the cake and then post it to instagram and put up like a whole message with it and they see it and it just says like went with chocolate cake this week ran into some friends and sat down together it's fun to mix it up at a different table sometimes and then they all just like turn, and he's just like with a mouthful of cake. He's like, oh, no, 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 no. "What do you guys want? Not sharing." <laughs> so of course they're just like, "What the fuck, dude? What's with this picture?" And he gets super nervous because apparently he had to stay at the inn with his parents, and he just he panicked and took a picture of them out of embarrassment, and then blocked it out from his memory. <laughs> He completely <laughs> forgot to talk to them about it afterwards. <laughs> I, I love this line of logic because he seems like such an honest person about this all. He's like, I was there and I witnessed a friend to a shocking sight and I really panicked. So I, I took a picture of you and uploaded it to Instagram and then I forgot. <laughs> uh, I, I do like, of course, then that Firmino has the reaction too. She's like, you know, that's fine delete the fucking photo or I will kill you. <laughs> I, I have a box cutter in my pocket right now. I will not hesitate to murder you. This is the moment where the series actually diverges and it, and it goes into like Doki Doki Literature Club all of a sudden. <laughs> uh, and the chapter ends with him doing it, deleting it, and then they make a joke about like why uh, Spieling and uh, it's because his name means to play music in Japanese. So it's a little... Japanese pun there, mm -hmm. and uh, it was this was a sweet little fun chapter. I, I I enjoy when the series doesn't work hard at trying to explain away the situations they find themselves in. I find that always to be when we never learn is that it's most amusing. Um, and again, it's just nice to get a chapter where like the humor came from something besides Fumino's breasts are small. I want to bring up. Because we haven't spent enough time talking about this. So, <clears throat> in order to introduce the idea that this picture on Instagram is not widely known, because Omori doesn't actually have any Instagram followers, somehow, you'd think that with that level of consistent updates that he would have somebody. People like pictures of food. That's why people put them up, I think. Um... He has no followers, but how did someone come across this picture of Yuiga and Fumino? Well, it's because Fumino has this heavily dedicated fan club that just apparently tr trolls through the internet, internet looking for any photos of her, like a bunch of creeps. So, Chris, do you want to make a pizza bet that these girls are in love with Fumino? <laughs> I mean, I was going to be like, Nick, are you going to tell me these girls also aren't in love with her? When you use terms like, I can get a fresh dose of, of Princess Furuhashi medicine, and they're blushing heavily while trying to approach her to say, that, how was your summer vacation? No, I don't think I would take that bet, personally. <laughs> so that's how they learn about it, is just that she's got these people who, like, apparently just can... How do they even find this picture if nobody follows it? They do you just think they that they just, have they image think... recognition software specifically to find Fumino's face on the internet? Yes, that's some yes. heavy dedication, Chris. Th they're insane, Nick. These these are insane people, and they could be our fans too. We don't know. All right, <laughs> that's that's the true terror of this. Time to go off offline forever. Okay. 
Well, I, I liked. Did you hear about the the movie Mother with um, Javier Bardem, Jennifer Lawrence? I heard a little about it. Yes, and apparently it was like entirely just uh, allegorical. Yes, but what I like is that there are some different interpretations of it, and one was the idea of that's what it's like to be a famous creator, particularly one who has any kind of social outreach with their community, uh, like as in they try to meet fans and things like that, because they're like, oh, it's a sh- like a movie where fans find their creator's house and barge in and begin taking their shit and wrecking things and ignorantly destroying their lives. You're like, oh. That is almost a dark way to look at it, but I can see that. Yep. <clears throat> Let's talk about The Promised Neverland. What? Okay. Let's do it. Chapter 76, The Battle Begins. So we actually get a, bit, a little explanation as to why the demons decided to go hunting so soon after their previous hunt. It was because, it was because uh, Lord Bayon... Uh, while they're having their little dinner together. By the way, do you think these guys just stay here, like, all the time? Are they, like, put up here, like, permanently? Don't they have, like, anything else to do? We haven't really seen the demons have to, like, operate in any kind of, like, life existence of their own. They seem to just exist to eat and experiment on how to eat things better. Like, we've yet to see, like, a demon community of farmers or things like that. You know, I suppose it's... that they're also all rich, so they probably just have, like, estates and stuff and don't need to actually do anything in order to maintain their wealth. Yeah. So. Apparently, Lord Beyond, their host, uh, had mentioned at some point that uh, they... Uh, that you know, he, was, he was just talking with his subordinates about how they had an escapee from Gracefield at their house. And there are, there were also two more that were with her, including another that was probably uh, highest grade uh, and the last one being an adult. And so the, all of the hunters are like, oh, man, I just got to get out there. If there's that kind of prey out there, I've got to have it. You know, I want to I want to eat that top grade child meat, you know. That's the um, name of my band from high school. Tough grade trial meet. <laughs> it's our first hit single. Hedgehog Coxmeer. So they were just like so excited over that prospect that they had to just go out and hunt immediately. And of course, Lufus was just like, yep, sounds good. <laughs> <laughs> Gotta go hunt that that little girl. Uh, so they go stalking around, of course. Uh, everyone seems to be hidden, but they can smell them hiding. Uh Immediately, a few people uh, get dis- get discovered, and the demons start to chase after them. One of the, it, one of the kids is from the windmill, from that little group, and uh, they look really creepy when they because they like just go it's like it's supposed to be like ha everything's going as planned. They're chasing after me as they as I wanted them to smirk, but instead you get them going grin. It's the I just planted I just fucking poured arsenic into your. Tea and you just drank it, you stupid idiot. Uh, the plan is going into effect. We get a flashback from the perspective of one of the kids in Lucas's group. I haven't remembered. I don't remember all their names. Sue me. Um, and uh, he was actually starting to really freak out, but then he just got himself like, "Okay, guys, listen. We still got our our plan all set." We're just going to be doing it a little bit early. Just think of it this way. By this time tomorrow, we're going to be free. We're just going to be free earlier than we were planning to. We're going to kill all the demons and we're going to get out of here. So grab your weapons, take your positions and just do what we were planning to do. So that's a little bit of, you know, like giving him a little bit of uh, having him hidden to stand out. I'll learn his name eventually, I'm sure. But we'll probably learn his name as he's dying in a couple of as he's dying. For the moment, though, he just kind of had... You know how people do with, like, that single blonde streak? He's got a single black streak. He's got the reverse rogue. Yeah. Do you think that, like, that's his natural hair? Because he's, you know... Most people in the province of Neverland have naturally colored hair. But Emma does have that antenna, so... (laughs) That seems to get more, like, longer with different, like, the growing chapters. It's as large as the rest of her head, yes, so... Nick, important question. In the first X-Men movie, they explained that Rogue got her streak of white in her hair 
because she held on to Magneto for a very long time and he had right. white hair. Right. Do you like that explanation for why she had no. the white hair? I kind of liked it. Oh, I'm trying to think. In the cartoon, did they ever explain it? No. In the comic book, I think it's just that she, you know, is this, you know, was an 80s punk, and so she had a white streak in her hair. I kind of like them giving, like, some context behind it. Why doesn't she have perpetual magnetism powers, though? Because she just gained a portion of it. It's just the physical kind. That'd be ridiculous if she had it. Well, she perpetu- she completely drained like Miss Marvel's powers when, and that's how she got her flight and super strength. Yeah, and so that's, and we all agree that's stupid, but no, we don't because Rogue kicks ass and punches Rogue things. Rogue kicks aren't. ass, but it is dumb that she took Miss Marvel's powers. Why is that dumb? Because it was just like she's not strong enough, and we're gonna kill, she's gonna permanently absorb the powers of somebody else. And uh, then she became kick ass, Chris. <laughs> she was kick ass before Nick. I think X-Men Evolution taught me that when she was a goth punk. I thought that that was odd at the time, but then when it looked, when you look back at the kind of character she was at the very beginning, it's like, it actually makes sense that they made that decision for her. <laughs> no, it made a lot of sense. X-Men Evolution Rogue was a great character. All right, Nick rank X-Men interpretations of Rogue from original franchise or movie franchise evolution in 90 series. Uh, movies end up being the worst. Okay. Because of the third movie. <laughs> and Kitty is the love interest. No, no she's not. <laughs> oh, it was so, it's just such a stupid movie. <laughs> it doesn't matter which one is the best after you have that. Because everything is the best if it's not the, that third if movie. If you're not compared to it. The fact that they went through like four movies extra to then reach a point where they're like we're erasing it we're erasing this from all time now the third movie did not happen cyclops is not dead gene is not dead (laughs) professor x didn't have to take over the body of a guy who looks exactly like him and is comatose in the hospital (laughs) fuck i forgot that's the explanation for it they're like, thank God Professor X found his way into the body of someone who looks exactly like him, but is also wheelchair bound. <laughs> oh, gosh. Oh, man. All right. Well, it turns we... out that Magneto deflected a bullet into this guy's <laughs> spine as well. <laughs> Damn it all. <laughs> Why didn't I check on that before I made him my go to? <laughs> There's no chance I can find somebody else who looks... Oh, there's one in the next room, actually. (laughs) Also crippled. Wow. What are the odds? Why is it that everyone whose mind has been put into a vegetative state who looks like me is also crippled? (laughs) Fuck it, I'm going to take over this porn star's body. "Ah!" He's like, that's the ticket. Gosh. <laughs> Shows up at the airport <laughs> at the end of the Wolverine in like a tube top in a Catholic school coast guard. He's like, Logan, we need your help. <laughs> it's like, what's happening? I'm confused and scared. Hugh Jackman's just like, you know, I, I can tell you're just talking about really serious stuff, but I'm distracted by the fact that you're wearing way too much makeup and I... <laughs> For some reason, all the emotions that you're making, I can tell you're just faking them. <laughs> it's like, could you? I can see the deadness in your eyes. I could take this conversation more seriously if your nipple tassels would stop twirling. He's like, you gotta work for the money. It doesn't come to you. They're my signature move. That's how I keep on getting. That's how I keep on getting gigs. <laughs> how do we get to these points? <laughs> oh gosh. All right, so they may, they stick to their plan. <laughs> the promise Neverland page four. <laughs> uh, yeah, so basically, what they're trying to do is the three pre- the three most dangerous hunters. They're sending out decoys. Meanwhile, Emma and Blonde with Black Street Kid uh, are going to be uh, drawing Louvis's attention, just distracting him while the other three uh, get lured off and then taken out. Um, and as long as they have Lewis out of the picture, they can destroy the other three groups 
and then they'll all gang up together on just Lupus. And uh, this is their best chance. They've got the surprise attack with their uh, hunters completely over- underestimating them, not expecting anything. Uh, so we'll just you know have them chase us, think have them think that we're unarmed and running away recklessly, and then we will will put our plan in action and strike. And uh, all three of the different decoys blow whistles in order to uh, <coughs> uh, in order to signal for the plan to go into effect. This huge explosion goes off in the distance, which causes everyone to go. Ah! Oh, they ran away! Damn it! <laughs> I don't know. Ah, shit. And uh, Lucas says everyone, you know, rushes off and into the trees to get their weapons, implement the plan. It's hunting time. It's morphing time? Awesome. Sure. Oh, hunting time. Never mind. That's not nearly as exciting. Do you remember the episode of Dexter's Laboratory? Can we do this? Do we have time? The style M for Monkey episode that okay. parodied Predator. Remind me of the plot, because I, I probably was do. This, there was this legendary hunter who uh, had Monkey appear on his like own personal planet, which was just his hunting ground. Yes. And Monkey tried to take him on with all his usual powers, but he had all this technology that counteracted every single one of Monkey's abilities. So Monkey tears his suit off and puts on you know face paint and makes up all these jungle traps and stuff, and it just becomes the last act of Predator. <laughs> yes, now that you say it, I do. Except that, you know, with a few jokes thrown in, yeah. That is... I need to watch Dexter's Laboratory again. I'm sure there's tons of references I never got as a kid. Classic jokes that just went over my head. Alright. Um, Seven Deadly Sins, Chris. Oh, are we done the chapter? Yeah, we're done with the chapter. It was a nice oh. chapter. I'm yeah. sure that the plan is not going to go as well as they think it is. Fair enough. All right, Chad. Five of these kids are dying. Like, <laughs> uh, Seven Deadly Sins, Chapter Two Hundred and Fifty Six, Piercing Sacred Sword. I believe is the name. It's a really small title, so on the page. So, yes. so. so last time, King Arthur got Excalibur, and as such, he was fucking some fools up. Except, as it turns out. He has fucked up none of those fools and, in fact, is completely hosed because all of the guys are fine. Not only are they fine, they're doing great. The extent of his entire attack essentially resulted in chopping Dozing's mustache off on one side. And he's really upset about that because it was the nicest mustache in the demon world. I think Chandler would disagree, but... (coughs) But it seems all of Arthur's efforts are not enough because these guys are just strong. They're in a different class. The four strongest demons there are. I guess maybe... I guess Esterosa might be the fifth. I I assume he'd be, like, right alongside them. Um, And Merlin gets this message that basically says Arthur's going to die. So Arthur is trying to attack, but suddenly the sword has become too heavy for him. And... He drops it. Basically, just oh no! Out of his hand I didn't realize it. that this was a chakra lightsaber. <laughs> <laughs> and he basically falls to the ground. And and Dozian starts to explain to him. He's like, first, y- your your big mistake was your lack of strength. You know, you don't have enough physical strength to wield that sword. Even if it has hundreds of swords, uh, souls inside of it, letting your power, you don't have the physical fitness and form to basically retain all that. Your body can't take it, and as such, it's being torn to pieces. And your second mistake was Tao picked the wrong guys to fight because I think Crunchyroll misspelled you. Yeah. And <laughs> didn't catch it. So, yeah. Uh, he's preparing to murder the shit out of him because they're going to murder the crap out of him. Uh, he says, back in the day, any who showed disrespect to ourselves or the royal charges were chopped into bits and became Indola's food. But that sight isn't worthy of Zelda Samba's eyes, so as a special favor, I will crush your heart. You only have one, yes? I like that knowledge of, like, human anatomy. But that's when Merlin it shows up. in your shoulder. Yeah, hang on, I'll find it. <laughs> it's in your teeth? It must be here where your dick is. Ow, ow, ow. Uh, that's when Merlin shows up. She's like, I'm going to take him before you can do that. And she flash freezes everybody, grabs Merlin, 
or Arthur. And there's a moment here where Mel Melodius is like, hand over the, the commandment of piety. And she's like, no. And Goodbye. <laughs> yeah, she's like, later. And she mentions briefly that your friends and uh, your lover are, are all placing themselves at risk in order to save you. Uh, and then she disappears and reappears over with uh, the rest of the group. There's uh, some brief worry. There's uh, some moment where Escanar is like, oh, you saved Arthur? <laughs> Oh, it did save me. You uh, weren't in danger. You, you keep on going on about how you're the strongest one there is. And then there's this moment that's pretty cool as Dozy is just saying like, Huh, well, I guess I got a little careless there, but I won't next time. In fact, I'm going to take care of the boy now. And he seems to use some sort of power to take control of Arthur's body where he is and basically like just starts to motion. <laughs> And just impales Arthur's own body with his brand new sword right in front of everyone else. It's a brutal shot because it basically covers like two pages of Arthur just fucking gutting himself with his own sword. It's brutal. And that's the end of the chapter. Yeah. I like the chapter. I don't think Arthur's dead. There's several no. characters right around there who I feel like could potentially have the ability to save him if they needed to. I like how they were just goes like, Elizabeth, you have to heal him. <laughs> Elizabeth, you have to heal him. <laughs> yeah, quickly heal him. <laughs> but I do love the power and how like cool that sequence is. And just be like, actually, let me take care of the boy right now. What douche. It's just, there's something very poetic about having him murder himself with his own special fancy new like, magic sword. Mm -hmm. It's very nice. It was a nice little chapter. Um, I'm, I, I am glad that Arthur isn't all of a sudden this ultra badass uh, can stand on the on the level of even above the seven deadly sins because that would be a bit much. Um, but it continues instead, you know, this you know side plot that he's got going of his development. Um, well, presumably, a big thing is going to be the awakening of his magic because it gets referenced several times in this chapter in terms of why he's not ready to actually use the sword at all. Mm -hmm. um, I do also want to make a note of even in like these, you know, like this person that Merlin is quite fond of is on the verge of death. So she has to come in and save him. Was, there are two really inappropriate shots. One where he just, she just smooshes his face against her boobs and the other where she strikes the most unnatural pose to continue smushing him against her boobs while the shot goes. I don't even know what side of her that's supposed to be. <laughs> it still looks very sexual. though. There is a it's very, like, very. This dude uh, is on the verge of death. Can you maybe like not make jokes about it? Uh, boob. Hey, if I have to die, Nick. Let it be in the bosom of a caring woman. Or on fire taking out Nazis. One of the two. <coughs> Those are my two ways to go. So, Ooh, Or I become an anaconda. And uh, ice, <laughs> ice Cube and Jennifer Lopez. <laughs> I just want to live the life of the mildly enjoyed 1990s. <laughs> Are you okay, dude? <laughs> it's too stupid to continue. John Voight, something, something. I ain't Captain Mateo. Go ahead. John Voight with his awful accent. <laughs> I did not eat your Captain Mateo. <laughs> Fuck, I love that movie. Oh, man. That movie got too <laughs> The snake vomits Sean Void up at them, and he has just enough consciousness in him to wink at Jennifer Lopez. <laughs> like he's just been crushed and digested for 20 minutes, but he's still like, one last gotcha. Uh. <laughs> Carry on, Nick. Black, Black Clover. Clover. <laughs> what's, his, what's his name's dead? Carry on. Page 146, New Future. <laughs> More awesome color pages from Black Clover. Dig them. Um, also, it only, just, it only just now occurs to me how weird Yami's physique is. It's 
This caveman, Jesus Christ, look at how long and bulky he is. Yeah. Um, but, uh, yeah, so the Wizard King is on the verge of death after having been stabbed with a huge-ass sword of light by Leashed. Um, and uh, he grabs the two magic stones that apparently the Wizard King was just keeping on him. And, uh, of course, Yami has just, has only just arrived there. He sees Vengeance's helmet. And he's like, wait a minute, you're a Vengeance! I didn't realize it until yes. now. <laughs> it's like, no, you have to have known. There's no way you couldn't have. Yami spots Marks from where... Marks is his name, Chris. The Wizard King's assistant guy is named Marks. Oh, man, I love Marks. Uh, from his window, and Marx is kind of panicking because, you know, he's dying. And Yami is immediately just like, what the fuck are you doing? Go get a medic, you idiot! <laughs> um, Leash um, is just like, he protected the humans of this country to the very end. You have my respect. But, and then his goons show up and are like, okay, bye. Never again will there be harmony between your people and ours. Ah! He's like, I had a much cooler speech, but I had to kind of definitely show up. Bye. It looks as though he's like, you know, jumping into the portal, like really in a really undignified way, too, because he's like. <laughs> Yami slashes with his sword, uh, but no, he can't actually get them uh, because they teleport away too quickly. Uh, King Julius is, is like, hey. That was a cool spell, Yami. It was sweet. And it was like, you're dying. <laughs> you really have become an amazing magic guy. I'm 28. I'm not a kid. That could have been me talking about myself, or it could have been me saying Yami's line. So. Uh, there's definitely a part of me that's like, oh, God, I'm older than Yami at this point. This feels... Well, no, it's because Yami hasn't aged at all over the course of the manga, Chris. It's fine. I feel like Maybe there will just... be a time skip and he'll be older than you again. I feel like I need to work out more. Get that <laughs> fucking physique and shit. Isn't it weird to think it's like when I first started reading Bleach, I was younger than Ichigo, and now it's like, and then by the time I finished, it was like this stupid kid. <laughs> when I started watching football, I was younger than the kids being drafted, and now if I was in the NFL, they'd be like, "You need to start thinking about retirement, buddy." <laughs> like, no. <laughs> <clears throat> the Wizard King says, "Like, no, it's okay. I've got a lot of breath left in these lungs before I choke on my own blood." The next generation has grown big and strong, and the generation after it is beginning to pull out, bu put out buds. My ideals will live on in the magic nights of the next era. I dream of a world without discrimination, where all are accepted, except the Portuguese. Ugh. <laughs> Yami's like, I'm gonna cut out that last line when I put this on his epitaph. <laughs> he just puts, except the Portuguese is the only part of his book. Says Epitaph, he's like, What part was I supposed to keep? Nah, sure, it's fine. So, <clears throat> meanwhile, uh, Mary Leona is still punching fire into Raya, and Raya's just like, I can't win. Time to use explosion! <laughs> um, and uh, so he's like, Ah, with this. I, my magic will react with any attack that hits me, and it will. And it's kaboom on contact. But in that instant, Yami suddenly de not Yami sadly, sorry, uh, Asta comes rushing in, hits him with his, uh, his magic canceling sword, and he's like, "Ah, fuck!" And Asta punches him in the face instead. Is and he says, "I've seen two other people try to blow themselves up like that. I know what it looks like already. You three-eyed jerk! Don't treat your life like it's garbage." And then suddenly he gets much more comedic looking because he's like, what's wrong with you people? All this stuff about revenge on humans. Are you not human? What's going on? Tell us about your people first and then listen to us too. And I'm not letting you die before you do that. And Mario is just like, how dare you interfere in my fight, you stupid kid. These people aren't interested in mutual understanding. That's why we have to crush them here, even if that means killing them. And that's just like, why? And I have to say, this is one of the, my favorite chapters with Asta, but for what he does in it. 
because this is act this actually shows like very very you know bluntly what Ast is all about, which is that he doesn't kill his opponents. You know, he defeats them and finds the the thing that's ailing them, and that he tries to fix it because he's that type of shonen character. And it might be because he's put into conflict with Mario Leona, who I hate in this chapter, and she comes off much the worse for this in the exchange. But I do really appreciate where he's just like, no, I think that it's possible for us to understand each other because, you know, duh. And something has probably happened to them to make them this way. So I think that we should, we can actually understand each other that way. And, uh, we also cut over briefly to the Wizard King again. He was like, I'm still not dead. Hang on. <laughs> I'm just waiting here. Lost upon. What I tried to achieve, the future I tried to build, I believe that they aren't far away. Royals, nobles, commoners, peasants, even people who aren't human. A country without discrimination or hatred. The new future I'll build with you. That. <laughs> <laughs> we don't actually see him die in this chapter. Do you think that the Black Clover would not kill him off? This would seem like a really, really dickish way to just pull the audience's heartstring if he was just going to be saved the next chapter. Like, having him go through this whole grand spiel about his legacy and what the next generation's done to this point, if someone was just like, Phew, we got a medic here in time. You're going to make a full recovery because you have time magic and you're special. They would be like, well, what the fuck oh, was the point God of all this? I was born special. <laughs> <laughs> thank God for that. Thank God for privilege. There is no such there is no real difference between those who are born wealthy and those who are born poor, those who are born powerful, those who are born weak. Anyone can achieve the same thing according to what their ambition and their and their fortitude. Oh, they're going to make a full recovery exclusively because you were born special. <laughs> oh, thank God. <laughs> He's like it doesn't matter if thank you're rich. God I was born poor. <laughs> <laughs> it doesn't matter if you're rich or poor, so long as you're born with the most unique magic type known to man. <laughs> the infinite. Asta concludes by saying that he is going to, you know, be Wizard King and he wants to build the sort of country where everybody can appreciate each other and joke and laugh together. And Mario is like, you stupid kid, you can't do that. Raya is a little taken aback by this because, like, he's actually serious. And I actually remember somebody else saying the same thing. If all humans were like you two, then maybe... But it's too late. It can't be stopped now. And we see uh, Leashed and his followers approaching uh, the plinth, I guess is the right word, that is, uh, they're going to use in conjunction with the magic stones. So, who knew what's going to happen, Chris? I don't know. It looks like, I guess maybe we're moving to a different sort of conflict here i uh, you know I, I do agree with you though i like this chapter because of what asta puts out there i know there's the whole notion of asta maybe hasn't fully demonstrated this before some people are bringing up in the chat i don't know if i can agree with that because i i again i don't remember black clover enough to really say either way so you know in a vacuum i enjoy this though because this does feel like what the sentiment of this series has kind of been about which is this idea that wherever you're from it doesn't matter and i i do like the idea of asta being like no don't kill yourself let's have a conversation you, you'll talk we'll talk we'll figure this thing together and i like the idea that because they've built up a lot that the idea that certain members of the older generation Mary Leona, yami you know charlotte like they're all super cool but i like the idea of showing too that like man Mary Leona is just so hardened by war that she's like let's just kill them they're all fucking dirty scum and asta's like no let's like not kill him because that's what you know, is kind of causing all the problems and everything like that. Let's talk to him. So I just like how it, it, it gives Asta like a strong, inspiring, heroic kind of moment. And I wish these were the moments we got out of Asta more than just like, that guy's a dickhead. I'm going to hit him with my sword. It would make him a more interesting character. Hmm. Batman. There are some characters that he has managed to connect to in this way before. This is not out of character for him to do. No, uh, I think some people are saying there are people he hasn't done this with before in the past, but I think maybe if he had been more consistent about it, then this would come off a bit more genuine. But it still feels like 
Yeah, I could see I could see Asta doing this. Well, yeah. I think other people too that he hasn't done it with have also been people engaging directly in like terrorism, attacking innocent civilians, and things like mm-hmm. that too. Which is somewhere you can understand maybe your thought process is protecting everybody first and going from there. Ah, <sighs> yeah. Um, that's it then. Uh, we don't have a One Piece this week, unfortunately. So that's it for Weekly Mug Recap this week. So let's, uh, let's name our favorites for the week. I'll mm. do my character first, because my yeah. character is Asta. I okay. like Asta a lot. I, I guess I give it to Black Clover for chapter of the week. I, I really... Mm. It's not a, not a strong week for chapters in general. So I think I go with Black Clover just because it's the strongest of the bunch. Yeah, not a lot of standout chapters, I agree. I'm going to go with My Hero Academia for my chapter of the week. Uh, I th- I had a lot of fun reading through it and then you know, going over it again. And there's a lot of stuff to go over in that chapter because there's, you know, the all the, you know, lighthearted stuff with the festival stuff. And then there's also the stuff with All Might and Deku. Um, my, my character is still going to be Asta, though. Um, he had definitely the most standout um kind of spotlight going on out of everyone in, in, in these chapters and he looked the best out of everyone who got that moment if it hadn't been asked it would have probably been Rindo honestly um, just because Rindo's great so it. okay that's uh, it for Weekly Manga Recap guys uh, so thank you everyone who joined us this week on, on the show we record Weekly Manga Recap generally speaking Thursdays at about 7 to 7.30 p.m. Eastern Standard Time on smashcast.tv slash RoloT and twitch.tv slash RoloT. If you want to stay updated on when and where we're going to do the show, if there are any changes, you can follow the official uh, podcast's Twitter account at WMR Podcast. And uh, your hosts are at RoloT and at Nick F. Time. We want to give a special thanks to everyone who supports us on Patreon. Your support allows us to create all sorts of fun stuff for you guys to enjoy. Uh, we got we did a lot of bonus stuff in the last week and a half that uh, you Chris has been putting up on the Patreon. Uh, co- digital commentary that people can see, uh, our bonus podcast where we discuss Riverdale <laughs> for champion level subscribers, uh, all sorts of stuff like that. And the Q&A we uh, recorded on uh, Monday. Yes. I give a special thanks to Holy Marcos Luna and Josh Baker, by the way, for all being new patrons it is greatly appreciated thank you very much everybody it is without your help we are nothing this moment mm. for awesomeness really feels like i just punched the camera like take this boom i got your money now i don't care boom <laughs> <laughs> if you want to check out more weekly manga recap you can see all of our past episodes on weekly manga recap on our youtube channel and on itunes if you check us out on those last two be sure to leave a comment rating and subscribe so that you can help us to beat the woodworkers and become kings of the hobby section and lastly, special thanks to Steve Manor Talk Artist. You can check out his work in a bunch of different places. He's got his own Patreon. And also to Infamous Planet, who does the framing and helps out on other stuff for the podcast. Our next recommendation that we're going to be taking is that we are going to get back to our JoJo's Bizarre Pokemon Adventure. We're doing JoJo we're... Part 5? No. Damn. With <laughs> the fourth general arc. I know that it's for technically it's further along because the arcs... Have... It's the fourth general collection of stories, Pokemon Adventure. It's the fire red, leaf green, and emerald chapters that we're going to be going through. It's uh, some good stuff, but also Nick's least favorite protagonist. So it's going to be an interesting discussion when we uh, when we get through all of that. That'll be the next one we th- that we cover. We'll see you guys next time. I don't have anything funny to say, so I'm just I'm, I'm going to cut us out. You guys got your fill on the rest of the episode, okay? Yeah, you got your goddamn money worth, you damn greedy animals. <laughs> Banana hammock.